skeleton, recovered from the grave. Perhaps a victim of medieval conflict. The only known evidence of the Battle of Lewis. On a lonely hillside, condemned men await their fate. You can't round up 20 or so large, strong, young adults and execute them without having the capacity to do so. Archaeology and forensic science combine, investigating the skeletons of Lewis. The medieval world, the 5th to the 15th century. Tim Sutherland is one of Britain's most experienced archaeologists. He and a team of specialists try to understand medieval life by exploring the realm of the medieval dead. We have a classic view of the storybook medieval life. We don't hear the stories about the common man trying to keep his family alive. In our stores, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of skeletons. Archaeologically speaking, we can now focus in on the medieval dead people. You're looking for clues in the skeleton all the time. And you couldn't help almost look through their eyes thinking, what did they see? How did they die? The town of Lewis, near the southern English coast, between the sea and the rolling hills of the East Sussex Downs, the gateway to England. But this sleepy town hides a violent past. Graves, skeletons, trauma, conflict. In 1264, the town saw at first hand the effects of medieval conflict. On the 14th of May, the Battle of Lewis ripped through the outskirts and suburbs as Henry III's men tried to protect their king against the rebel army of Simon de Montfort. I think um, the Battle of Lewis is one of those, is a very important battle because it, the, the vict Simon de Montfort's victory helped establish the first recorded representative parliament in this country. In May 2014, Lewis Castle is the scene of an important gathering to remember this significant event in the town's heritage. This was the 750th anniversary of that battle. So in the years just leading up to that, the whole community is getting really excited about it. And we had a lot of meetings and we're thinking, how are we going to celebrate this anniversary? There's a lot of interest in archaeology. To coincide with the commemorations, a single skeleton from Lewis has been selected for carbon dating analysis. It's one of more than 100 recovered 20 years before in 1994. The whole collection had been stored away, but new funding meant further research could be done. They called in one of Britain's leading specialists with a wealth of experience in archeological human remains, which bear the physical trauma of battle. I got involved in the Lewis project plain simply because I was invited to come to a conference in Lewis to compare known skeletal trauma from the medieval period with a skeleton that they'd found in the Lewis area, skeleton 180. 180 had been selected as it was thought to be possibly unique evidence of a body which could be linked to the Battle of Lewis. That skeleton, their skeleton, had obvious evidence of weapon trauma on it. And what we want, simply wanted to do was, is it comparable with other medieval weapon trauma so that we could say, yes, this looks like a battle victim. Tim got to work. He and osteoarchaeologist Malin Holst carried out a full assessment. They found the skeleton was that of an adult male. On his skull, there was the grim evidence they were looking for. As soon as we took the skull out of the box, it was evident that it was covered in extensive weapon trauma, but almost certainly sword trauma. And again, that doesn't look like interpersonal violence. This looks like it's a battle victim, basically. And once you've seen a few of these, they become very, very similar. Uh, when you attack somebody with a sword, quite often you aim it at the head, and you usually end up with very, very similar injuries. You know, you either cut into the skull, or you just miss it and skip off the top or you stab it 
And those are basically the, the, the type of wounds you get, and sort of all different degrees of that. But that's it. And of course, once you get two or three or four, then it's not sort of a, a small bit of violence. This is extensive violence. And this is the sort of trauma you get in medieval battle. And so it did look as though it was a battle victim, and that was that. But there was only one way to prove that the skeleton could be that of a victim of Lewis's medieval battle. We were no nearer to saying, yes, it's definitely from the Battle of Lewis, which everybody was assuming. So I just suggested, right, well, let's try to narrow it down. We'll try and get a radiocarbon date for it. We'll date it. And hopefully it will fall in nicely into place right over the Battle of Lewis. Yes, everything would be sorted. We'd go away. Everybody would be happy. A sample of bone was sent away for the carbon-14 analysis. It seemed a date relating to the 13th century battle would be a formality, and so preparations in Lewis intensified. Getting ready for the Battle of Lewis anniversary is just amazing. It was a very, very exciting, very frantic time, and looking after the, this whole project to do with Skeleton 180 is, was one of the most exciting parts of that project because I knew that we had something really exciting to tell people about. It was a great chance to help engage people with archaeology and to find out more about a real person who really lived at that time. Revealing the story to the world was to be the crowning moment. Months of preparation had built up to this. Marlin was invited to present her findings from the analysis of the bones. Yeah, we're looking at the back of the skull, um, as you can see here. That's the forehead there. So this is the, the, the back here of the skull, and this is looking at it slightly from above. And I hope you can see we've got three um, cranial injuries here. That's the first one there. That's the second one. And then there's the third. There's quite a nice clear cutting edge here. And with a sword injury, what you usually get is one clear cutting edge that's almost very shiny and then a breaking edge on the opposite side. Now this is quite a large um, injury here and it's actually caused these, all these bone fragments to be cut off but also to be blown apart. And, and that occurred to the top of his skull and probably the attacker came um, and attacked this person from the back um, and from the left hand side the main event. It fell to Marlin to disclose whether the skeleton truly dated to the Battle of Lewis in 1264. Now it's, it's always quite difficult to, to um, get a precise date from radiocarbon dates, but it dates to 887 um, before presence, which is 1950, which makes it 1063 AD plus or minus 28 years. So it's 200 years earlier than we expected. I hope I don't get rotten eggs thrown at me now. <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> and of course that throws up, as Chris mentioned earlier, much more questions really than it answers. Not exactly the date everyone was expecting. I couldn't speak. I was in shock. And it took me two or three days just to be able to call my boss and tell him. And he couldn't really deal with it either for quite a long time. We'd found this completely different individual who had potentially died in a completely different um, violent era in our history. It's just extraordinary. We, what we were hoping for was something as a highlight of our Battle Lewis anniversaries, our Battle Lewis skeleton. Um, but here was this, he was nothing to do with the Battle of Lewis. <laughs> the date was seized on by the media and became headline news around the world. The speed of this took everyone by surprise. If it's 1066, this in some ways is more important because of course there is, as far as I know, there is no osteological evidence of anybody who died in the Battle of Hastings. There's very little physical evidence of the battle at all. And so, of course, suddenly, everybody's ears prick up. You think, oh, the Battle of Hastings, wow, this is, this is really important. So, of course, people grab this headline and then start to run with it. And it's almost, it's almost out of control. And it, the gossip spreads, it's in all the newspapers, and it's literally going around the world. And you can't control it. Once that date is out there, somebody might have found something from the Battle of Hastings, it's off. 
and it's got a life of its own. Excuse me, stop this. This, this is just a preliminary analysis. We're in the middle of something and you're finishing it off and saying this is what it is. The carbon date range was from 1035 through to 1091, yet the media only focused on 1066. Hastings, where King Harold's Saxon English succumbed to William the Bastard's Norman invaders. It's almost 30 miles from Lewis. It's possible that some casualties might have been taken from Hastings for burial elsewhere, but these would most likely be high status, and that's not suggested by 180's grave. It's also plausible that he could have been killed after Hastings as part of the Norman suppression of East Sussex. But just one man on his own. Tenuous indeed to link this to the conquest without further evidence. Just because it centres around 1066, it doesn't mean to say it's not 1100, for example, or into the 1150s. In which case, are there conflicts in and around Lewis from this early period to the, to the much later period? And, and is it possibly one of those? And it's nothing to do with either the Battle of Hastings or the Battle of Lewis. This is nothing new to Chris Whittick. Living in Lewis as I do, I've been used to the knee-jerk reaction that any find of a skeleton from Lewis has is a fatality from the Battle of Lewis. Chris is the senior archivist for East Sussex. He's been studying the history of the county all his career. It's disappointing that when scientific evidence proves that a skeleton from Lewis can't have come from the Battle of Lewis, that the knee-jerk reaction is to attribute it to another historical event, this time the Battle of Hastings. Both seem equally flawed and equally un questioning of the historical evidence and the potential of these finds to, to give us real information, real facts about what took place in Lewis and its vicinity in not just the 13th century, but the, the last two millennia. Tim decides to leave aside for now the Lewis and Hastings battle hypotheses. He looks back to the original dig for some clues. Very little was known about the medieval hospital of St. Nicholas until the excavations in 1994. The hospital itself had long since disappeared, leaving an area known as Spittal Cottages. It's now thought the hospital was at the epicenter of the fiercest fighting in 1264, further explaining why the theory came about that 180 died in the Battle of Lewis. I'm going to set the scene really for the discovery of Skeleton 180. The dig supervisor in 1994 was Luke Barber. He oversaw the excavation of all 104 burials. We don't necessarily know trauma, pathology, etc., etc., on these unless it's really obvious at the time. So, of course, yeah, we sort of started getting a little bit twitchy about the Battle of Lewis because we know all the rumours and we know where we are. Tim has a lot of experience with medieval mass graves, especially when they're the victims of conflict, like the Battle of Towton excavations in Yorkshire. But the St Nicholas Hospital burials don't fit the pattern of conflict graves he's familiar with. He needs to find out more about the 94 excavation. The best way to do that is to speak to the man who did the digging. Tim catches up with Luke in the field hard at work on another site near Lewis. In 1994, the main area he excavated was beneath a school. Finding 103 burials at the site was not unexpected. Right. I think the children who had their dining hall above it were more concerned <laughs> than being eaten above these. So these was guys. it a known medieval cemetery? When you it was, it was a it. known medieval hospital. Right. The burials um, Luke and, and the team found were, were more varied uh, than might be expected from a single event like a battle. There was a few unusual burials at the time. You know, yeah. uh, there's one with a manacle around the ankle. Right. Yeah. Um, so obviously, even at a very early date, it, it was it was there was a, a range of, of types of burials. You could see there was infants. You could see there was males and females. And again, right. fairly typical for what we expected from hospital. Yeah. Yeah. Of 103 skeletons, 180 was one of only four with trauma. The obvious connection was that those trauma victims were going to be. Um, Battle of Lewis. None of the original uh, analysis involved any C14 dating. Yeah. 
the, the dating was based on its association with the hospital yeah. and also um, the few finds and pottery found within the grave soil generally. Yeah. One thing always worried me about it is if you look at this basic plan of the, of the cemetery, the yellow highlighted uh, bodies are the ones with trauma and you can see they're not all together. That always worried me and that's why in the report I actually said, you know, Battle Lewis quite possibly for some of them or all of them maybe, yeah. but other scenarios cannot be ruled out. Mm. You know, it's, it's very easy to jump to the conclusion. <laughs> it's got a sword cut, therefore, the only thing that's likely to have caused that is the Battle of Lewis. Mm. You know, there's footpads, there's outlaws, there's all, any number of ways that in the medieval period someone could have been killed with a, uh, a sword or a, a sharp-edged weapon. Mm. Skeleton 180's 11th century carbon date wasn't a problem for Luke. I wasn't unhappy about the date. <laughs> because I say there was always these worries about why were they not buried together. Mm. So to have quite a wide chronological range within this group of individuals does not upset me at all. Right. Um, and because 180 does not now appear to be Battle Lewis, that doesn't upset me either. Yeah. It's, not, it's not a great wind out of your sails. What upset me more personally was the fact that it rather suggests that the hospital is a pre-conquest foundation. Well, that's what's so interesting. I mean, was, was there supposed to be something on this site at that period? We're no. talking... Well, not that we knew of. Right. Not that we knew so of. So that's quite important, really, isn't it? So for the archaeology of Lewis, it's a, it's a very important discovery. But the other thing is, of course, we've got one date for one skeleton. So, of course, it's more important that we analyse the dates of all the other, or as many other skeletons as possible, especially the trauma victims, because, of course, if we're talking about the same dates for those victims, it looks like something is happening mm at that time. Until we got them, we don't really know where we're going. Right. You know, we, it, it could be a, a, a wide chronological range. We could get Battle of Lewis in there. Um, we may find it's quite early, much earlier than we thought. If the medieval St. Nicholas Hospital wasn't the first building on that site, then many of the graves too might be much earlier than expected. The whole understanding of this part of Lewis might have to be rethought. The quandary about St Nicholas Hospital is this. The burials are in the backfill of quarries. The quarries, it has been assumed, were used partly to build the hospital itself. The hospital is thought to have an immediately post-conquest foundation. So what is a skeleton of the date that the, the scientific dating has produced doing in the backfill of such a quarry pit? It, at the moment it doesn't add up. So what we need are more dates from more skeletons to try and put what we have in context. For this reason, it's decided to test more of the burials from 1994. Tim helps Edwina with the additional skeletons selected. We've got 11 skeletons here that we've got from the store. It'd be really good if you could just have, have a look at them. Yeah. Um, and these are all from one cemetery? They're all from St. Nicholas Cemetery. Right. Yeah. The 11 include the three other cases which bear trauma marks. Oh, I can already see on this one that they've got some sort of cut. See the, uh, the injury there? So this has got at least two on. This wound there is typical of medieval conflict. Mm. And when somebody's had a go at the head, mm. and obviously it was too, too high, the sword bl blow or whatever it was was too high, mm. and, or the man ducked. Mm. And so, of course, what's happened is it's glanced off the top of his head. Right. So that, although it's put through the cranium, it might, doesn't necessarily mean he was going to be killed by it. So it almost looks like he missed there, to us, although he yeah. definitely hit it. it. Do you mean it's, it's sort of sliced the top of his head off? Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost, almost like a glancing blow, that one. More than likely, this one was second because they've gone for the head and the yeah. neck, and that's exactly where it's hit. Yeah. So you've got a chop going in there, and it's in that direction, so it's from the back of the head. This is the, the base of the skull, the occipital. Yeah. And if you feel the back of your head, you can feel where the occipital uh, and the muscles join oh, yeah. the occipital. And there's, yeah. a, there's a bump. Yes. The base of your skull is. Well, that's yeah. basically this area here. It's where all the major muscles from your neck attach. Okay. So somebody's been going for the neck. And in this case, they've been very successful because they've chopped straight through the back of the skull. And so, of course, this would have severed the the muscles on the back of his head, yeah. and it might even have broken through his spine, spinal mm. column, and therefore killed him straight away. Yeah. That looks pretty convincing from a, for a, a conflict situation, yeah. put it that way. Would he be wearing any, um, any protection? Any, uh, well, this suggests that he wasn't wearing headgear at this time because those are two nice, sharp, bladed injuries to two parts mm. of the cranium, so it suggests he's not wearing headgear. So he couldn't go through 
Very you wouldn't go visible. through a, a steel helmet. You could argue that it was a very sharp sword. It was something like a leather cap or right. a leather helmet, even a boiled leather helmet. Yeah. You could suggest that it might have gone through that relatively easily. Yeah. But even so, they, they offer quite a bit of protection. Does. Mm. But this is, it means he's definitely not wearing a helmet yeah, as we I would, if we would you know, envisage it. So that's interesting that we've got one individual and it's two blows and it looks like a complex injury. Archaeologists have to check every single bone of a skeleton for evidence. Weapon trauma isn't always found on just the skulls. So you think this individual has got uh, trauma on as well? This has got trauma as well, yeah. Right, excellent. So um, and there's a, a lot more of him <laughs> remaining. And he's got a spider. Yeah, yeah. excellent. <laughs> right, so we're talking about uh, arms and legs. Another arm. Uh, pelvis. I haven't got his trauma. He's a, he's, um, a male, 35 to 45 years old, just so you know. So, sacrum. That's always a good one. That is an amazing... So that's definitely piece. interesting because we've mm. got the left thigh and it's got a fantastic cut mark through it. It could be a spade cut from the excavation, so it doesn't have to be battle related. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty sharp. That's not a spade, is it? Mm -hmm. So it's a very sharp uh, bladed weapon, or it's a very sharp implement that did mm -hmm. it. So just looking at that, I, I would assume that it's pr more likely to be a bladed weapon rather than something like a, an over-ambitious ar archaeologist, for example, <laughs> yeah. or, a, or even a grave digger. There's trauma from a sword or other blade on this femur. Tim checks to see if it also impacted on the pelvis. Pubic symphysis is at the front, so that's there. Okay. So that's the front. So now if we put that where it belongs there. Yeah. So what we've got now is we've got the blade wound going across there. Yeah. And as you can see, there's nothing corresponding. It, if you look at it, it goes from there to there. And it would have just missed just it. Miss, is it not the injury would have been painful, no, though not necessarily no, fatal. No, For most of the skeletons here, there's no trauma. No clue as to the cause of death. You could slit somebody's throat mm -hmm. and you could not touch any bones mm -hmm. and of course that person would bleed to death and then you never know how they died. Right. And of course if you died of a disease and it was a very rapid disease where you died within a few days and there's no trace on the human bone from that disease and of course you don't know how that person died either. Or you could just die, simply die of old age. And so it, we're very, very fortunate when we get an individual and if we see the exact method by by which they died. And, so, uh, and, and what interests me here is obviously it's conflict related. Hopefully the carbon date for these skeletons will bring new light to the story of the St. Nicholas Hospital site and 180. They don't have long to wait. The results come back and they range in date from the late 10th and 11th centuries, right through to the late medieval, the 15th and even into the 16th century as you'd expect from a hospital cemetery which lasted hundreds of years. But when it comes to Skeleton 180, there's another surprise in store. The initial dating was flawed. When recalibrated, it comes out not as late Saxon, as everyone had got used to thinking, but between 1215 and 1280. So he could date to 1264 and the Battle of Lewis after all. It's just this, it's another layer in this story. And through, um, we thought it was from the Norman, we thought it was from the Battle of Lewis. Then we think he might date to the Norman Conquest. So we, in that time, we found out lots of new things that we'd never have known about if we hadn't thought it was from the Norman Conquest. Now it turns out he isn't from the Norman Conquest but we've got far more knowledge than we had even imagined having before. In some ways it's a shock, but this is what archaeology is. It's never static, it's never really boring, and it will really up upset you. And that's why you've got to be really careful about nailing your colours to the mass. Say, this is 1264 or this is 1066, because of course it could be a major upset and you go, oh, suddenly I was wrong. But there are still other reports of mass graves. How do they fit into the archaeology of Lewis? This small Sussex town hides dark secrets yet. 
One thing is for sure, the graves can't all be from the Battle of Lewis. This is only a small town. We're surrounded by hills and we keep finding these big pits of bones right in the town centre. So supposing they're from the Battle of Lewis, we've found about 2,000 so far. And I, every time there's a building development, I think, are we going to find are we going to find the other 700? Because you know, there's only so many more places we can dig. It's not just in the modern era that these burials have come to light. The early 19th century was a time of sweeping industrial change across Britain. Lewis was no exception. In 1810, three pits were discovered not far from St Nicholas Hospital. According to reports at the time, there were nearly 500 bodies in each. No record remains of the exact location, nor of any related artifacts. Then, three decades later, another mass grave was unearthed. This time, a newspaper recorded the event. Maybe this account contains a clue. It was 1846 when the railway first came to Lewis. John Bleach has researched the story. He's found the original account from a Sussex newspaper. It records the discovery of the railway skeletons. In the 1840s, the railway was king. Nothing could stand in its way. Certainly not the mere crumbling ruins of an archaeological site like Lewis Priory. The story is that they found some human remains and yep. the, the, again the story is that the human remains relate to the Battle of Lewis. Now, yep. Can you enlighten us any further on that? Then? Sure, I can confirm that the London, Brighton and South Coast were building a railway from Brighton to Lewis and the route took it through part of Lewis Priory. The, the plan here shows you it brought it through the chapter house, through the actual choir of the large monastic church. So it's quite was, destructive oh, in that respect. Yeah. Totally. Uh, one thing that was definitely found, and it's marked on this plan, was a large pit, sometimes referred to as a well, of, full of bones. Uh, estimates are that there were 600 bodies. I'm looking at the report from the Sussex Agricultural Express, January 1846, and it, it talks about the excavators finding this, this mass of human bones, described as nearly six feet thick, ten feet in diameter. So that's a quite a yes, large, significant, a amount, significant of, yes. amount of bones, which were deposited 18 feet below the surface, so they are quite a long way down. Right. That this was an original burial was established by the fact that when the bones were first exposed, the effluvium was so obnoxious as to cause the men to desist from their work until the next day. Several, in fact, were taken ill. Now, now I'm no archaeologist. Smell coming out of a pit of bones? It would have to be yeah. something that was probably wasn't the bones that were smelling, but it might be the context that they were in. So it might, be, it might have been okay. an existing well or something. Okay. And okay. therefore it was okay. or had been waterlogged. But then the paper goes on. The bones were conveyed away in about 10 railway wagons. And this gives us some idea of quantity as well. This is 10 railway wagons. And were thrown into the mass of rubbish which forms the embankment through the brooks. Human bone used in the building of an embankment. In 1846, the priority was the railway, not archaeology. It is a source of deep regret that human bones should have been employed for such a purpose. And you can just imagine the editor thumping his table. There is something so revolting in this appropriation that we cannot permit ourselves to speak upon the subject, lest our feelings should be excited to censure with severity the despoilers of the dead. Isn't it wonderful? But if we compare <laughs> this to the modern press, <laughs> would that make a good story if they were just reburied in the churchyard? Or would it make uh, uh, a good story if they were... Now, did it actually happen? Well. It sounds and good. You don't always believe what you read in the newspaper. No. It does sound good. And if it didn't happen, where on earth That's are, are they dreaming this up from? Yes. It does look as though it's based on truth in terms of its location, where they yeah. found them, the yeah. extent of how, yeah. how many there were. But Seems we don't know whether it's related to the Priory, or whether it's related no. to the battle, or whether it's related to some to unknown, some early unknown unknown content. church. Yeah, 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 yeah. So quite. We have no bones, we have no artefacts, as far as I'm aware, that were found at the bone mm. pit. So, quite where one goes from there. And we don't uh, know if there were any of these bones exhibited any 
uh, evidence of no, trauma on them or anything. No, we don't know anything about them at all, do we, really? It doesn't say anything about trauma in the reports that we have. This is where With no evidence of trauma, it's yeah. difficult to back link back the bones to the Battle of Lewis in the way they did at the time in 1846. Also, there's something about the position of the grave that doesn't seem right. When you look at the plan, you realise that the bone pit is, is just outside the, the eastern point of this large monastic church. Now that's, that's very conveniently placed. But ritually quite an important site. Yeah. One of the most important One of the most apart important from inside sites outside the church. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So would you actually create a battle pit there? Answer, possibly, possibly, possibly not. not. No. Rather than a mass grave from the battle, the bones might just have been the accumulated remains of many years of ecclesiastical burials. Lewis Priory was founded by the Normans in the 1080s. As with St Nicholas Hospital, it was on a site, like the whole area, that had been in use for centuries before the medieval. I think the important thing about this area is that is when you stand on a, on a hilltop like this and you can see how the landscape is surrounding you, it literally is, because you've got high ground over there, then you've got Lewis in this lower ground and then you've got high ground over there. It's a way of access from the lower ground and the sea up into the high ground, so of course you can use it to your advantage. If you own this ground, you can tax people, you can sort of restrict their access, you can control them. And also you can build a castle here and you can start to defend this piece of ground, this access into the high ground. And in that respect, it's perfect. There have been countless generations of occupation here, in this narrow corridor of settlement, bounded by the high ground. Because of its restrictions, unless it goes and expands onto the high ground, there's only a certain size this, this town can ever expand to. It's a town that's never been developed. So we've still got the medieval setup for this town that's never expanded into the 21st century to the degree that other uh, big cities and urban conurbations have, have, have expanded in different places. So basically what we're looking at is the, essentially a medieval town. People have been living and dying here for hundreds and hundreds of years. So all these burials are still here. And now, of course, they're coming to light. And we're thinking, why are all these burials here? There's nowhere else to go. Lewis was an important area centuries before the high medieval period, back in the Dark Ages. There's nothing dark about the Dark Ages at the time. What's dark about the Dark Ages is our lack of evidence for what happened, but both documentary research and archaeology is doing a huge amount to lighten that darkness. But it is clear, and it's been clear for a long time, that, the, that Anglo-Saxon society in general and its administrative capabilities in particular were highly sophisticated, much more sophisticated than the Norman systems which followed it and which eradicated it largely. From around the 9th century, Saxon England was made up of a network of burrs, or walled settlements, protection against Viking raids. Lewis is actually a Saxon town, and one of the wonderful things about this, this Saxon bur system of Saxon burrs is that they were designed to protect people, so that if there was an invasion by the Vikings, if attacked by the Vikings, that the people from around about could come into the burr and be protected. So the Although in many ways the town looks similar to that now, we've got the same high street, we've got the same little twins leading off it. We've got this enormous Norman castle where we would have had the fortress of the Saxons. This was before the days of the great battles of Lewis or even Hastings. But there were still many ways to end up in the grave, bearing the trauma of a violent death. Lewis was fortified um, by King Alfred as a, as a burr against the, the Danes and was clearly an administrative centre of long before that. Chris Whittock has studied the few remaining records on Lewis in Saxon times. As an administrative centre, it would have also been the centre of judicial activity, um, both civil and criminal. So you always have to contemplate the fact that skeletons you're finding might not have died an unnatural death or a casually violent death, but perhaps a death meted out by the operation of justice, because Lewis would have been the, the, the place in this area of East Sussex where such things would absolutely have happened. Another burial, 
this time certainly a mass grave, hints towards this administrative and judicial activity. On the opposite side of the town to St. Nicholas's Hospital, the land rises steeply to a long ridge which overlooks the whole of Lewis. Mauling Down. Mauling Down is one of those very mysterious corners of Lewis. It's, 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 it's high up, it's got a beautiful view, the, you know, the winds are sweeping by you as you walk along. It's, it's a wonderful sort of wild, has a wonderful sort of wild feeling. Um, and it's a very strange and lonely spot. It was on Mauling Down in the 1970s that a local boy made a grim discovery. In the 1973, uh, a schoolboy who was playing in the field found a human skull and picked it up and took it to the local museum and said, yeah, this is what I found, you know, what is it? They took the decision to do an excavation using local archaeological volunteers. And in the summer of 1973, from what we can gather, they opened up a, a large excavation area and um, recovered about 12 um, human burials. More than two decades later, archaeologist Greg Shooter was called in after more accidental discoveries. We were approached by the landowner who'd found some bones on his site um, and was concerned they could be humans. The, the bones had come to the surface through rabbit um, digging and so they come out in a spoil and then drifted down this bank uh, and was basically sitting on the footpath at the bottom of the bank. When, when we looked in the, in the rabbit holes, we could see more human bones in situ where the rabbits had dug around them. So it's clear that they'd come from burials, in situ burials. This is the site of the excavation um, from 1973 and 2005. And as you can see, we're on a prominent hillside overlooking the River Ouse. The dig unearthed two burial pits, one larger than the other. They were a few feet apart, right on the edge of the slope. This side, we've got the main burial pit with the burials in and the smaller one on this side. In both pits, the feet are pointing in towards this area. We investigated the area in between to look for more burials and found nothing at all. This certainly wasn't a grave which had steadily accumulated bodies over the years. The stratigraphy showed that this was one event and that it basically dug a, a shallow, very large shallow pit on top of a, 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 an earlier field system boundary uh, and placed these burials or deposited these burials face down into this pit in, in one event. To help develop an impression of what must have happened here, Greg compared his dig with the earlier one. When we looked at the 1973 excavation plan that we'd drawn up from the photographs and the rough plan that was drawn at the time, we saw that it fitted in quite nicely with our excavation plan. One detail related to every skeleton. We had evidence of all the burials having their hands crossed behind their backs. Um, and the wrist area of the hands is, is crossed, indicating that, they're, that they've been tied. Again, another similar shot, face down, hands tied behind the back. Again, face down, hands crossed. Same characteristics, face down, hands crossed. There was certainly one um, individual that had, who appeared to have clenched his fists as, as he was executed, whether that's just post-mortem um, settling of the bones or whether he was actually gritting his teeth and clinching his fist, we don't know. But things like that were quite eerie. These three have gone in first, this guy's then thrown over the top of them and then this guy is dragged over the top of that one. Eleven men, hands tied, buried face down, one by one. All the evidence seemed to indicate that they'd been executed. After the dig, there wasn't time for anything more than a brief examination of the bones. Now a decade on, Greg revisits them to search more thoroughly. Helping him is osteoarchaeologist Lauren McIntyre. We've had another look at these skeletal remains to see if there's anything missed um, after the original assessment of them and see if there's any more new evidence that's come out which will give us a bit more of an understanding of one, how they died and two, who they were. The bones have been stored away for years. So the first thing Lauren has to do is to check everything is still there. 
First of all, we would, um, I'd lay the skeleton out in an anatomical position. I'd do a general assessment of things like preservation and completeness, measure all the long bones and try and work out sort of the height of the individual when they were alive, try and um, assess the age at death of the individual, also whether they were male or female, uh, and then I would have a look at uh, all the bone fragments to see if there were any pathological lesions that could tell us if they had any diseases or traumatic injuries or things like that. This individual looks to be, again, it's a young adult male, we're probably looking about 20 to 30 years, maybe, all right, more, maybe more around the 25 mark. Still quite tall, we're looking at about 5 foot 10, so he's still quite a tall guy for, for around about that time. It looks as though he's got a kind of hip deformity that's had a, perhaps a little bit of a knock-on effect on uh, some of the rest of his body. This is actually the top of the left femur and you can see that if we compare it to the right femur you can see that they're very very yeah. different. Yeah. Um, this could have been uh, for a congenital reason so it could be some sort of congenital hip dysplasia um, or it could have been some sort of traumatic event that happened when he was very young and then it's just kind of never really it's never righted itself. Um, they're obviously all males, they're all of a certain age, they're all from sort of mid-adolescence through to um, young to mid-adults. Um, there's um, clearly no females there, there are no children either, um, which is uh, quite unusual if you were looking at a sort of normal um, sort of parish population or a normal village population then you wouldn't expect, you'd expect to get a mix of everybody, not just men. Um, so they look relatively healthy, there's no signs of deficiency or di dietary deficiency in particular, no malnutrition. Um, there's not very much in the way of healed injury, so um, we're not perhaps looking at something like a group of soldiers or anybody who's been killed in a, in a battle or anything like that. If the men had been fighters, Viking raiders or other incomers, there might have been some evidence of healed trauma after a life of training and conflict and there are no other obvious causes of death. If we're looking at something that's not really leaving an osteological signature behind for us to find, um, so um, normally we could say that might be a, a sort of infectious disease, um, but obviously I think the archaeological context has suggested that that's probably not the case with them having their hands tied behind their backs. Um, so in that case, uh, we're perhaps looking at something like uh, strangulation or hanging. Possibly these are locals rather than possibly Viking marauders, there's no obvious signs of battle injury, which you'd expect with a fighting group of men. At least one of them has got um, problems with his hip, which may have actually made him not a very good soldier or, or, or fighter anyway. So possibly we are looking at a, a, a local population or a selection from that local population who've been taken out and executed. Executed on an ancient land boundary. A high place visible for miles for all to see. Everybody in Lewis would have been able to see that execution and they can see it from a high point. Everybody had been out on the streets looking at that execution. That all, it, was, it was done there for a reason. By late Saxon times, the law codes ensured English kings exerted total judicial control. Convicted wrongdoers were banished, outcasts from society. The condemned lost not only this life, but they were denied entry to the next. Buried in pagan grounds, at the limits of Christian society. Evidence of Lewis's early medieval past, a vanished Saxon society. I, I can imagine they were terrified. Um, they're obviously leaving families behind. They're probably not local, so at, um, in an area that they didn't understand, possibly not even understand the language. So I, I get a sense of, of quite a lot of trauma and, and um, dismay up here. <laughs>